Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week we are on chapter 31 in the Book of Remembrance. And this week we're going to be talking about the parable of the garden. This is a very short chapter, it's only 20 verses. But there's a lot to unpack in here, and I doubt I'll be able to cover everything. And as usual, I would love to hear your thoughts after you've read this chapter, prayed on it, and and given it some thought, contemplated over it. So let's start with the first one. It says, I shall give thee a parable. The church is like a Lord who has a beautiful garden, and in it are 32 paths with the tree of life at the very center. Now, let's break this down and talk about what we're seeing here. So, this is a parable, and a parable represents something. And the thing that I love about parables, and the reason why Jesus taught in parables, and the reason why Kabbalah is taught in parables, is because I'm going to give you my thoughts on it, and there's going to be multiple thoughts I'm going to share with you. And you can have your own thoughts on it, because a parable allows us to understand what it is the Lord needs us to learn at whatever moment he has placed that parable before us. So when it says the church, what is the church? I know a lot of people think the church is an organization. It's whatever church they belong to, but that's in the scriptures, that's not what the church is. In the scriptures, the church is the body of Christ. It's us. Now, if we group together, you know, where two or three gather in my name, there am I, Jesus said, then yes, that's a church. And so because of that, we're going to look at this parable on at least two different levels. You can look at it more, but I'm going to start on at least two. And the one is that you are the church as a person, I am the church as an individual, but also together we are the church. That doesn't mean we necessarily belong to the same man-made organization, but it does mean that we worship the same God. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, And we are sharing in our common beliefs and therefore in common goals. And that makes us, in a sense, a church. And in a third way of looking at it is an organization. Whatever church you might belong to, that is an organization. It's alive and it's life's blood are the people that have needs and the people that fulfill those needs. So we have the church. And the church is like a Lord who has a beautiful garden. What is a beautiful garden? Well, Gardens represent growth. That's what we're here to do. We're here to grow. That's what Kabbalah is all about. It's to help us in our spiritual journey. And in this garden are 32 paths with the tree of life at the very center. So what's the tree of life? Well, here's where it gets interesting. In Jewish Kabbalah, they have this idea of these 32 paths of knowledge or 32 paths of wisdom or 32 paths of creation. I like to call it the 32 paths of creation. We are God's creation. And so we walk through these 32 paths as we grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the light of Jesus Christ, in the hope of Jesus Christ. There's a very old book called Sefer Yetzirah or the Book of Formation. It's an old Jewish book, Jewish scripture. Kabbalistic scripture, I should say. It it wouldn't necessarily be considered typical canon for those of Judaism. But if you're a Kabbalist, It's most likely scripture to you. And it is one of the earliest and possibly one of the most important works of Kabbalah. I believe that it is a revelation given to the Jewish people from the Lord. The oldest known version of the book is from 6th century AD. And according to that book, these 32 paths are made up of the 10 Sephirot. And and we're going to get into the Sephirot later on in the book of remembrance and the 22 letters of the Aleph bet. So if that's true, then how are these 32 paths with the tree in the center? Well, if you actually look at like on a computer screen in a book or on a piece of paper, if you look at the tree of life with the Aleph bet placed in all the positions between the 22 points on the tree of life, then you'll notice that, those Sephiroth, that tree of life, are really what hold the whole thing together. So while in Jewish Kabbalah, 
this idea of the 32 paths represent the 32 stages of development in, we'll say, I don't know, some sort of cosmic intelligence. For us, this is the path that we walk as we are growing in Christ's grace. Now, part of this from the Kabbalistic worldview comes from the idea, if you read the creation story, the name of God as Elohim is mentioned 32 times. And if you are you know, familiar with this podcast, you know that the days of creation tie into the Teshuvah meditations that you do for a week and you do them for four weeks, which makes a month. And so if you're walking this path every day, you're doing your Teshuvah meditations, you're going through that creation cycle over and over again, then you're walking these 32 paths. As you are going through the garden and the tree of life. So that tree of life in the in the very center is, as I said, interwoven within the olive bet, placing it in the very center of the garden. So in verse two, it says, the Lord places a gardener to watch over his orchard and look after these 32 paths that they don't grow wild. And, and the gardener is also there to help guide those that would walk the paths. So we can look at this a couple of different ways. Number one, I want to point out that in the first verse, it's a beautiful garden. And in the second verse, it's an orchard. This is important because the beautiful garden represents our growth and the orchard represents, Kabbalistically speaking, the scriptures. So the Lord has placed a gardener, us, to watch over the scriptures, to read the scriptures and look after these 32 paths. Now, in one aspect, you could say that could be the Holy Ghost because it's the Holy Ghost that helps us understand the scriptures. And internally, I, I think that makes sense. But as we move along in the parable, I'm not sure that it continues to make sense. So I want to say the Lord creates within us a desire, a desire to read the scriptures, a desire to grow the, the other desires in the garden. Because keep in mind, Kabbalistically speaking, the rocks are a desire, but they're the lowest form of desire. And then the plants are another type of desire, a step up, and then the fish, and then the fowl, and then the animals, and then the the most mature desires are Adam and Eve. They're, they're the people. So we have a desire inside of us to study the scriptures and help grow all of these desires existing in this garden to make sure it doesn't grow wild. Now the Lord in verse three says to the gardener, watch over the trees of the orchard and the field and walk upon these 32 paths daily. For as long as you walk these paths, Peace shall be in you, not with you, not by you, in you. This is very deep. We're watching over the trees, studying the scriptures, the orchard, and we're, we're walking this path. We're walking in Teshuvah daily. And as long as we do so, that Holy Spirit will be with us. We'll be growing in the grace of Jesus Christ, and that light of Christ will go out from us to help heal the creation. As mortal beings, we have doubts. Verse 4 starts with the word yet. Yet because the gardener appoints others in his stead to walk the paths. I'm not going to do the walking. I'm going to have someone else do it for me. And he's spoken to himself saying, this task is impossible for me alone. And so the people don't say, look there. The Lord is walking about in his orchard. He, the gardener, is assigning another gardener, one for each of the paths. Now, in one aspect, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because these are our desires, right? So in a sense, our desires are walking the paths. The paths are still being walked, but there's a problem. They're not united. But before I get into that, I want to backtrack because right now I'm still talking about us. I want to point out before I move on that this can also be speaking of an organization, right? Because if you have a church, you have a bishop, a pastor, you have teachers, deacons, priests, priestess, high priest, high priestess, maybe. You have people called to the ministry within your congregation to help grow that congregation, to make, help make sure that the wants and needs of the people are met and that spiritual enlightenment is facilitated. But we're all human beings. We're all imperfect. So even though the Lord's going to call a lot of different gardeners to work in the fields, in verse 6, the gardener says, I now fear that the other gardeners shall say, Behold, 
This orchard and these paths they do belong to each of us. And thus in fear, he's walking the path and chasing the other gardeners about the orchard so that no one has peace upon the path. We see this in churches today. Instead of saying, hey, we're all worshipers of the same God. We're all the seed of Abraham. We have this whole low here and low there mentality. Come to my church and mine alone. Everyone else is wrong. And inside of us, the Lord gives us different talents. Are we embracing these talents? And if we are, are we letting one talent supersede another? And I want to share a story about myself. I, I think I might have shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again because it, it works here. When I was younger, when I was in high school, I was called out of the blue to talk in front of the congregation in the church that I belonged to back then. I was very shy. I'm actually, I've mentioned this before, I'm an introvert. So I had some ideas of what to say as I was walking up there and I was feeling really confident. But the moment I looked out there at the congregation, my mind went blank and I panicked. And I, I said something, but it wasn't anything uplifting, enlightening, or even interesting. I basically just said the topic that I was given to talk about. And that was it. And I said it several times until finally the bishop got up and whispered in my ear, you can go sit down now. And I made a vow then and there that even though the Lord gave me a gift to run and hide when I panicked, not to do so. And thankfully, I had an opportunity in that church. They had what I like to call open mic Sundays, first Sunday of every month. And so I was able to get up and bear my testimony once a month. And the first time I did it, I just kept saying the same thing. That, that If you're familiar with the Brighamites, you'll, you'll know the, the standard testimony. I just kept saying it over and over and in my head. I know this church is true. I know this church is true. I know this church is true. So I get up and I say, I know this church is true. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And I ran and sat down. And then I challenged myself and I prayed to the Lord because I knew I couldn't do it alone. That the next time I got up, I would say more. So I got up. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I know the Book of Mormon is scripture. Name of Jesus Christ, amen. Ran sat down. And every week I kept going back. I could have used my other talents. Talents of avoidance. Talents of running and hiding. Talents of disappearing into a crowd. But I needed to walk all 32 paths. I couldn't let just one of the talents the Lord had blessed me with take over and not strengthen the others. And I had read in, for the Brighamites, it's in the Pearl of Great Price in the book of Moses, the story of Enoch, how the Lord had come to him and told him, I need you to go speak to these people. And Enoch said, no, I, I, I can't do it. I can't speak. No. But the Lord said, I will take your weakness and I will make it strong. And I believed that the Lord could do that for me, just like the Lord did that for Enoch. And so I kept getting up and Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you right now, if I would not have done that, there's no way I could have lived the life that I've lived, have the jobs that I've had, make the videos that I'm now making, do this podcast or anything else. We have to not let one part of our personality or one part of our talents take over and dominate all of the other things the Lord has blessed us with. Because if we do, then the weeds will come up and the garden will withdraw and there will not be peace within us. And it's the same thing with churches. When we have someone in a congregation trying to do everything and no one else gets to do anything, the congregation can't grow. When you have a church saying, we're it, everybody else is wrong, come here or you're not really with God, then there can't be peace in the kingdom. We can't build Zion. So now in verse 7, we see that the gardener is walking the path in fear. He's chasing the other gardeners about the orchard. And so there is no peace upon the path. Now we see this in our lives when we are too judgmental against ourselves. And we see this in the various church organizations when there's contention within a congregation or a church or between in the kingdom between various churches. That's not what the Lord wants. And that's why 
the Lord is sharing, in my mind, that's why the Lord is sharing this parable. Because it's okay for us to train our desires to walk the path. That That's the whole point. It's not okay to do it in fear. It's okay for us to serve one another. That's the whole point of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel of hope. It's a gospel of service. As we do so, we can't serve the Lord in fear. We serve in faith. And as we see in verse 8, And thus did the weeds come up, and the garden withdrew, that the piece of the 32 paths could not be found. So there's a lesson here in what we're trying to avoid as Latter-day Saints, as ministers, and as Mormon Kabbalists. We want to walk these 32 paths in peace, in the peace of Jesus Christ, and not in the fear of the adversary. And in verse 9, the Lord says, And thus is the kingdom of heaven, for it is so large that it may fit all of the creation within, yet so small that even one of the seed of mankind cannot fit if their ego be too great. If our egos are too large, if we're too busy thinking about how amazing we are, how much better we are than other people, then we're not living the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole point of Mormon Kabbalah is to weed out that egoism and replace the egoism of Cain and Lilith with the Christ-like altruism of Jesus. And we obviously can't do that all at once. That's why we need the grace. But we start off on the path as Adam and Eve. But we mess up. We partake of the fruit. And we grow into Cain and Abel, and Cain slays Abel. And then we grow into Seth, and from Seth we begin teaching our desires to love one another. And that really, I mean, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know that's really what the Book of Remembrance, the first portion of it, is about. It's about that growth in our ministry to the Lord to help us grow as individuals on this path and to help one another grow because that's what Zion is. That's what the kingdom is. The kingdom of heaven isn't one person trying to rush and be the only one at the top of the pyramid. It's a circle where everyone is one. And that's what it says as we move forward here. In verse 10, the tree of life is one tree. It has 12 sides the northeast, and the southeast, and the upper east, and the lower east, and the southwest, and the northwest, the upper west, and the lower west, the upper south, and the lower south, the upper north, and the lower north. What what are these? These are the cardinal directions that surround the earth. Any direction you move is going to be one of these directions. And it says in verse 11 that these continue on forever and ever, for they are the arms of the whole world. For they are a circle, and a circle has no beginning and no ending. And that's how we need to be. It's like King Arthur and his knights. They sat at a round table because there was no one at the head. Our desires need to work together to be one in Christ. We, as congregations, as a people, as a kingdom, One church can't be better than another. One person in a congregation can't be better than another. We all have to work on being a part of that circle. And what's inside the circle? Verse 12, inside the circle is the tree. And these 12 sides are the 12 Shavet. Thus the number 12 is sacred. So what's Shavet? Now, when I received this revelation, I have to tell you, I had no idea what the word Shavet meant. So the word Shavet is Hebrew, and it has two different meanings. When it says the 12 Shavet, that can be the 12 tribes, but it can also be 12 rods or staffs. It's a stick that a shepherd carries. And so I think the reason why the Lord gave us this word instead of just saying the 12 tribes is because it isn't just a tribe as in our genealogy, our birth heritage, or 
what we're assigned to, that rod or staff is a tool that we're going to use to walk the 32 paths. If you read the story of Moses, that rod was miraculous. It is a, a sacred tool that the Lord has given us to accomplish his works and his will. So inside the circle is the tree. And what is the tree of life? If you look at the tree of life, the Sephirot, you'll notice that on the right, that's our right. And the left is our left because it's a mirror. We are created in God's image. So inside the circle is the tree. Inside is us. We go in all these directions, but we've got to pull it inward. We have these 12 sides. We have these 12 staffs, these 12 tribes, these 12 rods. And in the center in verse 13, it says, my 12 tribes with Dinah in the center, my 12 apostles with Mary in the center, and all of these with me in their midst. So on the outside is that desire to bestow because it's male. The 12 tribes are these 12 men. These are the cardinal direction of us bestowing in righteousness. The 12 apostles, they're witnesses of Christ. They're sent out into the world to bring that light of Christ, to bestow that light of Christ. But in the center is our desire to receive in righteousness. That's Dinah. That's Mary. And we're doing all of this with Jesus Christ in our midst because that's the light of Christ. And it gets right back here in verse 14 to what I said a few verses back. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yavah is our Elohim. Yavah is unity. It's a circle because we're all one. All of our desires need to be united. Everyone in a church or a congregation or both need to be united. All of the churches, for us to be the kingdom, need to be united. That's what this is all about. The Lord didn't call us to a church. The Lord called us home. The Lord called us to be Israel on that straight path to God. Verse 15 and this because the white stone is precious. What's the white stone? It's an urm and thummim. It's a seer stone. And in it is the sea of wisdom. Seas go on forever. You can't see across them. Never ending wisdom. And thus is it that blue and white are the colors of the tzitzit. Let they that have ears hear, for this is wisdom. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what this means. I'm going to tell you what it means to me, but you need to figure out for yourself what it means to you. The white stone is revelation. So the white threads of the tzitzit. If you've ever met me in person, you'll know that I wear the tzitzits for them on each of the four of my sides, just like it says to do in the Torah. And the white is to represent the revelation. And the blue is to represent the wisdom. So in this, the father and the mother are represented. In this, the Son and the Holy Spirit are represented. That's why the Lord has commanded us to wear the tzitzit. And I'm not telling you you have to wear a tzitzit. That's entirely up to you. I do it because the Lord has asked me to. It's in the Torah in the Old Testament. It's in the Torah of Moses. And I just feel very impressed by the Holy Spirit to wear these as a symbol of my faith in Jesus Christ. Why is it a symbol of Jesus Christ? I believe that verse 15 is telling us that this is why we wear it and what it represents. Verse 16, Israel is holy unto me, for they that are Israel do take the tree into their hearts. What does that mean to take the tree into their hearts? They're taking life, the light of Christ. It's who we are. It's a mindset. It's a change. We've come to Christ with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And so we're allowing that light of Christ to purge out the egoism. 17, and this tree is a pillar that extends from the heavens to the earth. And her name is righteousness. I think it's interesting here that it's a her. The tree is a her. And we'll learn more about this as we get deeper into 
the rest of this book. But I know righteousness is one of the names of God. So normally would say his name is righteousness, but this tree is righteousness and her name is righteousness. And the tree, if you read the Old Testament, there are many biblical scholars who believe that mentioning trees, that's when it's talking about the divine feminine, our heavenly mother, is how we would say it in the Latter-day Saint movement. In the Book of Mormon, that idea of the tree becoming Mary in Nephi's vision of Lehi's dream, that is showing that Mary is a representative of heavenly mother upon the earth. Back when Lehi was in Jerusalem, at the time he left, there was a white tree representing God's wife, our heavenly mother, in the temple. He would have understood that. Nephi would have understood that. It's something that was lost to the original readers of the Book of Mormon in these latter days, but biblical scholarship has made us aware of this truth. And so we know that the tree is a feminine and that her name is righteousness. Verse 18, For it is not of mankind to take the earth to the heavens, but to bring the heavens to the earth. A lot of people want to escape this world. They see it as some sort of hell that they want to get away from. But this is God's creation. Anything that's negative that happens here is because we're polluting it. We can't take the evil that we've created on the earth and take it up in the heavens. That's, that was Nimrod's sin. But we can take that light of Christ and let it shine through us and bring the heavens to the earth. And remember that this is God's creation and that the Lord said of it, it is good. Then it says in verse 19, They that do this are my church. For the priest and priestess do prepare the earth for the coming of the heavens, and the high priest and high priestess do bring the heavens to the earth. And I am the great high priest, that's Jesus, and all they that serve the church and walk the path and prune the garden, they are mine. Now, in one aspect, this makes it sound very clear that it's referring to actual church organizations or the kingdom of God, and I'm sure that that is correct. But I want to be very clear that it's also talking about us converting our desires and that our desires that serve the great high priest allow us as individuals to walk the path and prune the garden. And only by doing that ourselves can we collectively do it as congregations and as churches. And brothers and sisters, I'm sorry I'm on a bit of a soapbox here, but I want to testify to you that one of the most important things that you can do at this point as we're moving forward is focus on ending the war of words between the churches of Jesus Christ, between the various Christian churches, the Latter-day Saint churches, between the Christians and the Jews and Islam, between Islam and the Jews, how can we help provide peace in this world? That's what we're called to do. That's how we can bring the heavens to the earth. So when someone wants to be contentious and they want to fight with you, love them. Jesus commanded us in the fifth chapter, the ending of the fifth chapter of Matthew, to love your enemies. So if someone from another church starts trying to Bible bash you, Ask yourself, is this brother or sister in Jesus Christ my enemy? And if the answer is no, then love them. And if the answer is yes, then love them. I hope you take the time to read this parable on your own, to study it and pray on it, because there's so much here. And I feel like I barely touch the tip of the iceberg on this. And I believe that it is important because until we can figure out how to walk these 32 paths as individuals and as congregations and churches, we can't build Zion. And every Latter-day Saint wants to build Zion. So brothers and sisters, let's build Zion in our hearts and work together to build Zion in our communities. Until next time, Shalom, and God bless.